you have to think differently. Um, you know, if you look at a problem the way everybody else does, you're probably just going to copy other people who probably do it better than you. All right. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Welcome back to the Spark XM podcast. Today, I have a super special guest. His name is Jeff Smullyan. Jeff, it is great to speak with you again, and it's such an honor to have you on the Spark XM podcast, where we share the stories of USC's finest student and alumni entrepreneurs. John, I'm looking forward to it. It's great seeing you. Awesome. Thank you so much again for hopping on, and let me give you a really quick intro before we get into the questions. So, All right. All right. For those of you who may not know, you are a USC legend. You are one of the GOATs. You are the godfather of sports radio, founder and CEO of MS Communications. Former boss of David Letterman and Mike Pence. Former owner of the Seattle Mariners, as well as a longtime member of the USC Board of Trustees, and so much more. He also recently put out a book called Never Ride a Roller Coaster Upside Down, and I have not been able to put it down, so I recommend all you guys listening right now, go check out the book, because it is amazing. Thanks. Jeff. Thank you so much for being on the show, Jeff. My pleasure, John. It's great seeing you. Great. So... I prepped a bunch of amazing questions for you. It's such an honor to talk to you. Jeff, why don't we start in your college years? When you were a kid from the Midwest at USC, what were your hopes and dreams for, the, for your future? And what advice would you have given your college age self? Well, I laugh. I can still remember Will, Will, Fer, Will Ferrell's line when he said, my hope and dream when I went to USC was graduating. Um, I, I don't know. I, I actually did have, I think, more optimism at that. I, I love my time at USC. I think I grew up in undergraduate school and law school there. I think that's why I have such a great affection for the university. I think the one advice, and I've given it to especially my kids, especially my daughter, Sam, who you know, um, is be intellectually curious. I look at my college career. I was interviewed uh, for, a, I think, a history of the law school many years ago. And they said, what's your one regret? And I said, I went to seven years of school and I didn't learn the things I should have learned. I don't want to tell you the things I learned. They were very valuable in some aspects of my life. But I really wish that I had been a more serious student. Um, I was a great test taker, so I always did fine. Um, but I feel like I wasted seven years. I can remember the line from Animal House where they, I think, Bluto is kicked out of school. And he's a sophomore. And he said, I have seven years of school down the drain. Well, I did get, I got two degrees in seven years. But um I, I, I always kid, I have so much more intellectual curiosity now, and I wish that I had that kind of intellectual curiosity then. But I loved it. I loved USC. It, it, I think it made me an adult, um, and that's why I have such a great affection for it. Yeah. Now, you're still involved with the school in many different ways, from being right. a trustee to being involved in so many other things. But let's talk football. Okay. Let's talk USC to the Big Ten. Jeff, you were involved in the switch to the Big Ten. Can you yeah. explain your thought process behind the decision as a Midwesterner and as a Trojan? You know, yeah. talk media deal. Talk, why is this deal better for us? What, how does it better position us for the future? Well, and I was involved because I think my original project was figure out what to do with the Pac-12. And I, I sort of realized we had three choices. We either had to fix the Pac-12, we had to join another conference, or we had to do our own media deal like Notre Dame. And all those options were available to us. The Pac-12's economics really got very, very bad from a series of significant management missteps in the conference. When I first looked at it, I said, boy, it would be great if you could merge the Big Ten and the Pac-12. Because it's very clear that in intercollegiate athletics, you're going to have two mega conferences, the Southeastern Conference and the Big Ten. Uh, so I was hopeful that they could both, that we could go in they really weren't interested in, in everybody in the Pac-12. They really wanted us. Uh, mm -hmm. We were the premier brand in the conference. Uh, they took UCLA along with us. Um, and then when the Pac-12 you know, disintegrated, they took Washington and Oregon. Um, but it was very clear that to compete in, in college athletics today, you really have to have the media revenues that are going to go to two places, the Big Ten and the Southeastern Conference. So revenue sharing, it puts us in a much better position. We're going to get way more eyeballs on the team, right? Yeah, and then, you will get many, many, many millions of dollars more in the Big Ten than we could have ever gotten in the Pac-12. That's yeah, just, because, that's reality. And, yeah. and it will get better because sports is developing into sort of two tiers. The NFL is sort of up here um, ahead of everybody else. 
but then behind it are the NBA and really the the major college athletics, which would be the Big Ten and the and the SEC. So it will help us not only in the current deals, but as we go into the future. I think you know financially, of course, it makes sense being in the Pac-12. I mean, being in the Big Ten. Right. But I think the question that some people might have is how do we continue the traditions and the rivalries? And luckily, we got UCLA coming with us, so that yeah. continues a lot of the traditions, and we'll still be able to play Notre Dame, right? Yeah, we will always play Notre Dame. I had wished, that's why I wished that the Pac-12 and the Big Ten would emerge so we could have kept all those rivalries and also had all the West Coast travel. At the very end, I sort of pushed to get or, or we, uh, Stanford and, and Berkeley in so yeah. you'd have six West Coast schools and it would have eased travel. But such is life. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would rather, you know, see us play Stanford than, than play Rutgers or Maryland. But uh, you yeah. can't always get what you want. Yeah. yeah, so that means no more weekenders, unfortunately. Well, yeah, I, it, yeah, I'm hopeful the Big Ten's going to end up with two more schools. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to see a 20 team conference. I would hope that they would pick Stanford and Cal. Stanford and Cal being in the Atlantic Coast Con Atlantic Con Post Conference makes no sense. It makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. but anyway, they, 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 they say our travel is going to be terrible, but you know, for Stanford and Cal, the ACC, I mean, that's yeah, that's a whole other animal. Yeah, so they they you may see other shakeouts and and working through this. I don't know. There's yeah. even people who've said that maybe we ought to have a West Coast alignment for all the other sports other than basketball and football, and ease on the travel. But we'll, we'll have to see see what happens. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm definitely excited as a fan to watch us play Michigan, Penn State, and I think from from a media perspective, you get so many more marquee games in a prime time yeah. window, and yeah. you know the consumer wins. But I guess if anybody loses, it's the athletes who have to travel. And potentially some of the former rivalries that we'd have. It is hard. It is an evolving world and sometimes not the ideal world, but you know, you sort of get the world that you have. Yeah. yeah. So continuing on this note of the evolution of college sports, what is your opinion on NIL and the expanded 12 team playoff? You know, headlines just came out that Caleb Williams, our, 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 our favorite, uh, he yeah. reportedly made over 10 million during his time at SC in two years while winning the yeah. Heisman. It's crazy, John. Um, I can still remember when athletes would endorse, you know, campus charities. And if they got, you know, and if there was any in remuneration, they were suspended. Uh, now a kid makes $10 million and it's, it, it's not a problem. They have to get a handle on it. And nobody mm -hmm. has a handle on it. It's the first time I've ever seen uh, everybody in agreement that the federal government has to step in and regulate it. That usually doesn't happen, but uh, I think you may see I, you, there has they have to get a handle on it. It's a mess. It's out of control, absolutely out of control. It totally is. And yeah, you no. Know, if you had to bet, do you think looking towards the future would this lead to a salary cap system like NFL football? I don't know. The problem is by paying athletes. You know, it's one thing if you have, you know. 40 college football players and seven college basketball players. And they were the only ones that got paid. But, you know, theoretically, you've got 600 athletes on campus. Now, how do you take care of all of them? How do you do that, you know, with, without gutting Title IX for women? How do you do it without, you know, gutting some of the minor sports? I don't know the answer. I think there will be some compensation. Uh, the new president of the NCAA suggested $30,000 for every student athlete on campus. Well, if you're Caleb Williams and you make $10 million, $30,000 doesn't do much for you. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're a, an offensive, uh, you know, if you're a wide out or a running back or a quarterback who might make two or $3 million, and it's just right now it's out of control. You know, they say in the transfer portal that great college quarterbacks are going to make, you know, a million and a half dollars. Well, if you're a quarterback at one school, and somebody would pay you a million and a half dollars to go to another school. It's crazy. You can see the incentives to leave. But on the other hand, uh, you, you'd like to see some continuity. And I'd love to see limitations on the portal. Um, and I'd love to see them get their hands on the, around the NIL situation. Yeah, because it's becoming more like free agency instead of really compensation is. for your performance, where you Every, earn brand deals, endorsements. Now yeah. you're just getting paid to transfer to the school, and it's like NFL free agency. Every every kid is a free agent every year in all the major sports, and you right. got to pay to keep them too. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's right. I mean, you know, so uh, like I said, if you're a quarterback and you're 
and you know, somebody's going to pay a million and a half dollars to go somewhere else, it's very unlikely that your current school could come up with a million and a half dollars to keep you. So it's a crazy world, and it, it you know, it, it begs for some form of regulation, and I think down the road we'll get it, be my guess. Yeah, that seems like the most reasonable path forward. Yeah. All right, I'm going to hit you back with another question about USC. How has the school overall evolved, you know, since your time as a student, yeah. since you've joined the Board of Trustees? What's different now versus then? Well, I got an alumni award a few years ago. I think it's on my, here somewhere you might be able to see it. Um, I've had a few of them. And I said, when I got my alumni award, if I applied to this place today, they wouldn't even let me have a brochure because they wouldn't want to waste the paper on me. And one of my friends was sitting there and he said, Jeff, when we applied to USC, the standard for admission is you have to be able to fog up a mirror and, and you get two out of three chances. Um, so, I mean, the idea was that if you were breathing, you got in in those days. And today, you know, our admit rate is well below 10%. Um, I am incredibly proud of the quality of students we have. I'm incredibly proud of the quality of the faculty and the staff. We have made, and not we, um, some visionary leaders at this university have made USC a world-class institution. And I, I think the vision, and this really, I give credit for Steve Sample, I give credit for Max Nikias and now Carol continuing it, is to strive to be one of the finest institutions in the world. Um, and well, I, when I went to SC, it was a nice school. It was a, a good school, nice school, um, but I don't think anybody would call it a world-class institution. And today, it's a world-class institution. And I'm very yeah. proud of that. And that takes world-class faculty, takes world-class students, it takes world-class commitment to excellence, and I think the university has done that for a long time. I agree. Yeah. Now, let's pivot to business here. Okay. Jeff, as an executive, you recognize so many super talented media personalities. Yeah. When you're looking at candidates, I, I really want to know, what jumps out to you where you're just like, I need to hire this person? How do you spot talent as an executive? I think you always look for passion. You always look for passion. You look for sort of, again, intellectual curiosity. You look for people who you want to see walking into a room. Um, you, you look for likable people, you look for smart people, um, and you look for people that you know are going to roll up their sleeves and get the job done. Obviously, it takes a certain intellect to do certain jobs, although I think people would look at me and say, well, it doesn't take that much intellect. Um, but I think, you know, I think you, you look for people who will move the needle and who will make things to happen. And I think that's something that you sometimes can spot. Uh, sometimes you see it over time. Now. You've been obviously great at finding media personalities and finding those people, but you've also been able to find consistently business opportunities yep. in media you know, across your career. Now, I really want to know, take it back decades right now with me, and let's talk, what was it in sports radio where you wanted to make that pivot? What did you think the market was missing? How did you bring it to life? And how can we in Spark, how can we use this as a case study for entrepreneurship students? Well, you always have to think differently. Um, you know, I always said, if you do what everybody else does, you're never going to change the world. I have also said the world is usually changed by lunatics um, who do think differently. I had thought of the idea of sports radio, believe it or not, when I was daydreaming in a telecom class at USC many years earlier. And the company had exploded. We had done only FM radio stations. Um, and we bought three stations from the Doubleday family, two FMs, one in New York and one in Washington, and we inherited an AM radio station, and it was the largest country music station in America, which didn't mean anything because it was in New York City, so it had more country <laughs> listeners, but it was like the 25th rated station, and it also had the New York Mets, and I always said, if you're going to you know, if you're gonna do sports radio, you need to surround it with an anchor tenant. You want an anchor tenant. And we had the Mets, and I came to our people with the idea, and they all thought it was a dumb idea. Emmett's has always been a very consensual group of people. So we had a manager's meeting, and we voted, and it got voted down. And one of my friends said, what do you want to do? And I said, you can't lead people if they won't follow you, and they don't want to do this station. And the next day, some of my managers came in and said, look, we still think it's a stupid idea. 
but we'll try it. Um, my idea was that sports is only going to grow in popularity, which is right. Um, today, if you look at television, 95 of the top 100 sporting of, or TV shows are NFL football games. So relative to society, and I always say, as society gets more complicated, people want to escape more. And I think they escape through sports. Uh, Karl Marx said, religion is the opiate of the masses. Well, in, in the United States today in 2024, sports is the opiate of the masses. And I sort of saw that. We put it on the air and it was a disaster. And it was called the Vietnam War of Emmas and Smolian's Folly. And then we merged it with the NBC frequency at 660. So we had a better signal. We put Don Imus on. We put Mike and the Mad Dog on, and then it, it went, it became a skyrocket. One of my favorite sayings, you read the book, is the line between being a genius and an idiot is very fine. Oh. And I've been on both sides, and I have the chapter called Idiot to Genius, which is WFAN, where everybody thought it was a stupid idea. And then it worked, and I went from idiot to genius. And now people say to me, did you, did you ever think there'd be 750 all-sports stations in America? And I said, no, after a year of it, I didn't think there'd be one. But you have to think differently. Um, you know, if you look at a problem the way everybody else does, you're probably just going to copy other people who probably do it better than you. So uh, I'm proud of it. I never dreamed it would get this big. Um, but you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And this one worked. And now it's led to a whole new industry of sports yep. media. You got Stephen A., you got Colin Cowherd. They're everywhere. Created a whole industry. Yep. Taking over eyeballs everywhere. Awesome. Now, I want to talk more about sports here. Right. Just for everybody watching, who this this may be a dream of theirs. Tell me what it's like to be the owner of a professional sports team. Tell me the story of what it was like owning the Mariners. What ended up happening in Seattle. It's a dream for so many fans, but you did it. You also drafted Ken Griffey. Yep. Take me through all of the stories here. Well, to set the record straight, we didn't draft Ken, Kenny, but Kenny came up when we were there and became a good friend. You know, it, it's funny. Uh, we had the Mets. We had sports radio. At the time, we were just buying major market FM radio stations. There weren't many more to buy. And and we were known as turnaround people, people who could turn around businesses and really, you know, create marketing niches. And um, so if people said, you know, you guys would be great. Would you think about the Mariners? They're our worst franchise. Mm -hmm. And I had been to Seattle as a kid and thought it was the coolest city in America. And so we fell in love with the idea. We did it. Uh, that's why I have the chapter in the book, uh, going from genius to idiot, because I was the boy wonder when we bought the team. Um, and I, and I, and one of my favorite lines is somebody said, every man in America wants to own a major league baseball team, except the 30 guys who actually do. Um, but I loved it. Um, you know, I, I think it's, I, somebody said, what's it like? It was a lot of hard work because the franchise had never made any money. Um, it had always struggled. Um, I was very proud. I think prouder of the things we did there than almost any business I've ever had. Because we had the first winning season, we turned around the perception. But we just weren't capable of losing 15 to $20 million a year. We weren't big enough. I, I said at the time that to own the Mariners or to own the Kansas City Royals, you had to be a billionaire. To, to own the Dodgers or the Yankees, if you had a paper route or, you know, you worked in the drive through window, window at McDonald's, you get on the Dodgers or the Yankees. But it was different, <laughs> different economics, before revenue sharing in different time. Now, you've and mentioned I this before. And I, uh, yeah. my favorite part was watching Ken. Um, and it was and it was it was fun turning around a business that nobody loved a franchise. No, it was just unloved uh, that they, they could a lot of like, there's a lot of stories in the book about how indifferent people were to baseball in Seattle. <laughs> but you turn it around. Would you say Seattle is a tough market to have a sports team in? It especially is. Especially for baseball when you have the Seahawks. It is. Seattle is a town. Uh, number one, sports on the West Coast, especially the Northwest, don't matter as much to people as they do in the Midwest and the East. Um, there was no tradition, no history. They really won the franchise in a lawsuit, um, which makes it tougher as well. Um, so I think, yeah, it was much tougher. Uh, we owned television stations all over the country and we owned the big CBS TV station in Portland, Oregon. And the guy who ran a TV group said, you know, we did employee surveys all the time. Why are we so much worse in Portland than we are anywhere else in America? And I said, because there's a mistrust of business in the Northwest and it comes from sort of an old Scandinavian populism. 
But I but I experienced that in Seattle. Man, people did no. not love but sports franchises or owners in Seattle unless you really, really won. And then they still didn't like the owners. Man. Tough tough place to do business, tough place to have a team too. Yep. Well, tell me about this. You also mentioned David Stern offered you an NBA team after the Mariners. Yeah. Tell me why you turned it down. Well, because I'm probably the stupidest person you ever talked to. Um, you know, when we got out of baseball, and I love David. As a matter of fact, I was just with Adam Silver talking a little bit about David. We had the All-Star Game in Indianapolis last week. Um, I love David, and I got – we both had this affinity for understanding the growth of cable TV and regionalization of sports, so I got to know him really well then. When I, when baseball – you know, when we, we left the Mariners, radio went through a downturn. Emma's had problems. And I said, David, I appreciate it, but I got to go fix my company. And it was not a close call for me at the time because I really wanted to fix Emmis, and I did. Uh, and I laughed a few years later because Emmis grew very, very big. Now, if you looked at the two investments, I should have taken the Rockets. They've grown very, very big. Um, but it was something that I, in retrospect, should I have done? Of course. I mean, there, there's so many things I could have done, but it's worked out pretty well. Can't complain. Can't complain. Yeah. <laughs> now, you also had a chance to bring an MLB team to Indianapolis. Yeah. This was a really interesting thing that I heard about. Yeah. Could you, why did you ultimately decide against it? And can you go a little bit deeper on the economics, TV rights, and fan base dynamics in that city? Yeah. In, in For baseball, even, even today with some revenue sharing, there's not enough. And if you're in a market like Los Angeles, where you've got, you know, 9 million homes, or New York, where you've got... You know, 10 or 11 million homes. Um, you have more disposable income. People can, number one, you have more eyeballs for TV and, and radio. You have more disposable income for suites, signage, advertisers. And at the time, I loved Indianapolis. When we looked at the Mariners deal for Indianapolis and decided then the market was just too small. Um, it's not only, people think Indianapolis is a bigger city, but it's not. It's only the 40th largest metropolitan area, which meant we would have been the smallest team in baseball by far. And in addition to that, it's surrounded by Cincinnati and Chicago and St. Louis and Cleveland and Detroit. So your TV market would have been very, very small. Um, and while I looked at, at it, we, we the, the, the team was the Expos. Baseball was going to do something with it. Um, we just decided the math wasn't going to work. As a friend of mine said, you've lived this once in a tough market, do you really want to live it in a much tougher market that's your hometown? And uh, you know, you're right. This is kind of tough. a lot of pressure. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Now let's pivot back to media here. You recently sold many of your radio holdings. Yeah. What do you think the future of radio and media is? What opportunities are you most excited about going forward? Well, we've divested because, and I love the radio business more than anybody. Um, when we had, 16 TV stations. We saw the economy was getting weaker. So we sold the TV to pay down debt. The challenge with all of traditional media is it's fragmenting. And as it fragments, it really limits growth. You know, I, I've always said we divested of all of our radio stations, but two, and I'm in the process of divesting of those. And the problem was the industry economically stopped growing. I mean, some, some years it's up 1%, some years it's up 2%, some years it's down 2%. Um, and in addition to that, with fragmentation, with Sirius and and with streaming and all of the alternatives, listenership has declined. So constantly, you're never going to see radio die because it reaches everybody and it's free. But on an economics you know, basis, you know, and you, all you have to do is look at the the economics of the three largest companies, all three companies, uh, have been in bankruptcy, the leaders, leaders in the industry. We were very fortunate. We paid off a lot of debt, and we came out of it with no debt and some money in the bank. Um, but the economics changed, and the industry was built on debt. And when the economics changed, the debt just, just you know, subsumed the survivors. So that's, that's really true of everything. Nobody's really found a way to grow. You're seeing the same thing with TV, where the erosion of cable... Um, and local television has eroded, radio's eroded. And yet on the other side, streaming can't find an answer to make money. So you really have an area where everybody's up for grabs and nobody's really making, a, you know, having great growth. 
Yeah, who knows what's going to happen? You got the sports media rights going for unbelievable amounts of money too. Yeah. It's like and, where is this going to go? And the problem is sometimes they become loss leaders. So it's a it's an interesting dilemma. It really is. Yeah. Now, give me another story here. What was it like to work with people like Letterman? He, I, if I remember correctly, you found him as a weatherman. Pence, yeah. Don, I miss. What were these personalities like? Well, I've I've always said everybody, you know, everybody's a human being, and you just, uh, you know, I love David. Uh, David was at the first station. We brought him into the first station I ever ran. When he took the job, he said, "Look, I'm going to do this for a year. Then I'm going to go to California and see if I can make it as a a writer and a comedian." And we said, "Sure." Love David. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, so many crazy things. I think I tell the story about one day I went to lunch and I came back and I had a call from an irate listener. And he said, Letterman's a communist. And I said, well, why do you say that? The guy said, well, I told him there's communists in Carmel, Indiana, which is a big suffer. And what do you think he said? I said, I don't know what he said. So he told me that we needed to give the, the communists Carmel because the schools are overcrowded. The football team's lousy. You can never find a parking space. So give the, car, the communist Carmel and hold the line at the next supper. So that was David. And David did all sorts of stuff. A like, brilliant guy. Uh, we stayed in touch. He stayed. He went on my board when we when we started Amazon. And, you know, I see him once in a while. Ma amazing guy. You know, but very quiet guy. David, when you put it, uh, turn the microphone on, is totally different than David when the microphone's off. But very good guy. And Imus was Imus. You know, Imus was what you heard on the air is what you got. He could be the ultimate curmudgeon, uh, uh, but another brilliant guy. Usually people that have that much talent are a little off center. And that was true of Don. That makes sense. Awesome. What was Clinton like as a leader? And if you want to describe a little bit of the work that you did serving the country. Well, I, I got to know Bill Clinton when I was in baseball. And we, we had mutual friends. And they said, you got to meet this guy. He's going to run for president, governor of Arkansas. So. <laughs> And I, remember, wow. yeah. and I remember my best friend was the president of the team, and I said, "I'm going to go meet. I'm going to go meet Bill Clinton tomorrow." And it was a Saturday morning, like a 7:30 breakfast. He said, nah, I'm not getting up at 7:30 to be. <laughs> and I met with him, and I thought this is one of the most engaging, brilliant human beings I have ever known. We spent three and a half hours there, and I just thought this guy. We talked about sports and economics and politics. One of the most intellectually curious human beings I've ever known. Um, so I supported him, did some fundraisers for him. When he got elected, they said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I, I don't want to leave Emmis. There's a constant theme in my life. I never wanted to leave Emmis, and that's why I'm still here 45 years later. Um, but if I could do something part-time for the country, it'd be great. And a few months later, they called me and said, look, the International Telecommunications Union has its major event uh, every four years. It's called the ITU Plenipotentiary Conference. The United States has a big delegation, about 50 people. We'd like you to be the ambassador in charge of the delegation. And I, and I said, well, I don't know how much I know about technology. And they said, no, no, you'll be fine. And I did it. I had about four or five bilateral meetings in the year before where I'd go to other countries and meet with their communications ministers. Uh, I went to Kyoto for six weeks or so. Absolutely loved it. And um, probably one of my favorite experiences was I got thrown into a negotiating session uh, to negotiate an agreement between Israel and the PLO. And it's hard to describe that in 1994, President Clinton had done the Oslo Accords, and it looked like we were close to a lasting peace in the Middle East. Now, it's hard to believe how far apart we are. But in those days, I thought, okay, this is just another step on the way to lasting peace. And it was fascinating. And I loved it. I also learned I could never be a full-time and government employee. It would be awful. But uh, but I loved it. I, I kid, uh, I guess you have the title of ambassador forever, but I've never used it. My wife said, you got to at least use it to get it at restaurant reservations. But I think it's a little pretentious. Especially in D.C. <laughs> yeah, really. All right. I got one more question for you here. You have done it all. You have rode the roller coaster. Yeah. What advice do you have for future entrepreneurs who may be watching this podcast and you have the passion, but you don't have an idea yet. What advice would you give someone? Well, find something you love. Find something you love doing. I always, when I tell college kids, I say, unless it's a felony, uh, if it's a felony, don't do it. Uh, <laughs> but you'll work harder if you find something you love. And, and you got to ask yourself a question. If you're an entrepreneur, uh, you have that passion, 
and nothing else matters. And, and not everybody is. And, and most of the people in the world don't want to be entrepreneurs. They don't want that, you know, that pressure on their shoulders. I always say that I like the ball in my hands to take the last shot, you know, and I think if you find something you love, there'll always be a good time for an entrepreneur. There are always time for good ideas. You know, you look at the top 20 companies today and probably 18 of them didn't exist 25 years ago. So I think the key is if you love something, work hard. Um, passion is the key. And surround yourself with really great people. Uh, I have been blessed. Some of the people here have been here with me for 30 or 40 years. Uh, they've been great people. Uh, and then you got to treat people well. I always say the most important thing the lesson I would live it, uh, leave is, the most important thing is, if your word is good, nothing else matters. And if your word isn't good, nothing else matters. So to entrepreneurs, I'd say, look, be people, be someone that people trust. Awesome. This was amazing. John, Thank you so I much for these stories. You. I, you, I'm so proud of you and happy that you're thriving at USC. Uh, and it's delighted to do this. Delighted. Really appreciate your time. Everybody who's listening, thank you so much. And make sure to check out the book. Amazing book. So, Thanks, John. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Hey.